welcome again to another program of Searching for Answers. We would encourage you to get your Bibles and turn to the New Testament, 1 Corinthians in the New Testament, and go to chapter 16. We're just about there, and uh, we've had some very encouraging words about the sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law. But thanks big to God, he gives us the victory through Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Therefore, my dear brothers, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Now, Paul's going to take on a different subject here. In chapter 16, verse 1, Bernard, would you read for us, please? Certainly. Uh, but before I do that, uh, let me just remind the listeners of the construct of a letter of the time. Mm -hmm. You, in contrary to ours, you put up front who it's from, mm -hmm. and then there was a portion of thanksgiving. Usually it was just a word or two, but Paul made an art form of that. Then there was the body, which we finished in chapter 15. Then there were comments to friends mm -hmm. and so on. And this can seem to be like the most unimportant part of it, but it's impressive in all of the, the epistles except Rome where he'd never been, how many people Paul knew and how many he cared about. It's an insight into his character that otherwise we wouldn't have. So let me be begin with 1 Corinthians chapter 16 and verse 1. And it begins with that trademark m that we have seen uh, several, quite a few times before, now concerning, indicating most likely that this is an issue raised in the letter he received from Corinth. Now concerning the collection for the saints, you should follow the directions I gave to the churches of Galatia. On the first day of every week, each of you is to put aside and save whatever extra you earn so that collections need not be taken when I come. And when I arrive, I will send any whom you approve with letters to take your gift to Jerusalem. If it seems advisable that I should go also, they will accompany me. Mm -hmm. Okay, keep going. I'll visit you after passing through Macedonia, for I intend to pass through Macedonia. And perhaps I will stay with you or even spend the winter so that you may send me on my way wherever I go. I don't want you to see you now just in passing, for I hope to spend some time with you if the Lord permits. But I will stay in Ephesus until Pentecost, for a wide door for effective work has opened to me, and there are many adversaries. Hmm. All right, Rick Rice. What Here's about this uh, collection for the saints? Can yeah, we talk about that? I think it's, it's a very interesting one. On, on Sunday. When it was decide. it taken up? What yes. does it mean? Uh, was this a meeting on Sunday or was this a private advice when they got the work going? I mean, well, this tell is us what you think. <laughs> well, uh, there are a couple of ways this is interpreted. One is to say that there was a Christian gathering mm -hmm. on what we would call Sunday. <coughs> And that Paul is saying, when you pass the plate, remember to uh, sure. take this, co you know, take mm -hmm. the money. I think, uh, I think Paul is hoping not to have to go around and make individual appeals to people for money. Or is to take right? a collection on a specific day and only get what that's right. they have in their pockets that uh, day. That's right. We, we have... Uh, Public ra well, let's say we have radio stations that some of us listen to that are listeners supported. And their uh, appeal is to have members join who will pledge a certain amount each month. Rather than, if you like what you're hearing, please send us a donation. No, mm -hmm. we want something regular. So I, g I get the picture here Paul is saying, make this a regular habit, see, so that <laughs> there's a, you know, an accumulation yeah. of contributions. So when I come, it's all ready. Isn't that what he says here? So oh, yeah. that when I arrive, <coughs> we'll have it ready to go. You won't be saying, oh, I'm so sorry, Social Security check comes next month. <laughs> <laughs> next week, rather. <laughs> um, maybe in ancient times, people weren't really thrilled to have to go around asking for money any more than they are today. <laughs> yeah. There's a real art to it. Uh, well, anyway, I, 
the other way is to say that what Paul is telling them that when you sit down on the first day of the week to decide how much it's going to take you to feed the family, transportation, the things you need to buy, pay the rent, whatever they spend money on, um, that's when you need to, in advance, budget something. Well, here. what's it's left like over saying, from the previous in, include week? Include this in your budget. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So it, it has to do with uh, a people what, something that people did privately in their homes rather than a group meeting where they're collecting something for, as a congregation. That's the way in which uh, I think Seventh-day Adventists typically respond to the suggestion that this is a reference to a first day of the week religious service that's taking place. Is there uh, support for that second interpretation? Well, um, yeah, uh, scholars of all stripe, uh, whether... Way in on this. Uh, yeah, huh? way <laughs> in on this. But no, it, it is the case that uh, those who have looked at early Christian worship, and it's been a subject of a great deal of keen investigation, the liturgy of the early church. Um, there are a number of scholars who have dug into this pretty deeply. I've noticed several things. One, apparently, is that the early Christian church borrowed its worship service, its patterns and practices, largely from the synagogue, which would be understandable. It would be surprising if they didn't. Mm. Um, but we cannot find any trace, either in synagogue worship or in what we can see of the liturgy of the early church, early Christian worship, we see all the elements, you know, prayers and proclamation and so forth, and you can, you can make out an, an order of service quite readily by, by working on it. There seems to be no element of taking up an offering. We don't see it in the synagogue. We don't see it in the early church. We cannot find any evidence that that was a regular part of the actual liturgy itself or a practice within the congregation an offering plate by the door or something. We just don't see it. So given that silence, it really does incline all scholars to read this as an instruction for what you do at home. I'm sure some of our <laughs> viewers are wondering if why we do that today, then, and if we should <laughs> return to the more, well, more <laughs> primitive form of moving right along. <laughs> <laughs> One other comment here, though, uh, is the reason for the collection, yeah. which is yeah. to take your gift to Jerusalem. The Mother Kirk, if you will, back in Jerusalem, mm -hmm. is where all of this started. And it's true that Gentile Christianity, and Paul in particular, was based in Antioch. But there was that pull and appeal of Jerusalem. Here are these people. We're now in Europe. We've crossed the Hellespont from Asia. We're far removed, except for Jews who are wealthy enough to have made it back to a festival. They'll never have been to Jerusalem. Yeah. to Palestine, but Paul has that concern and he wants, I think, that sense of belonging of this Gentile church yeah. to recognize where it started and to be a part of it mm -hmm. and to invite them to give. He wants the Gentiles to have that sense of belonging and he wants <laughs> the Jews in the headquarters <laughs> to have that sense of the Gentiles belonging as well. So yes. Paul has his own political, uh, I think, reasons for going sure. at this. But in yeah. a way, that's a wonderful testimony to the idea of, of a unified, <coughs> universal church. Yeah. So even though there are differences in geography and perhaps differences in background, maybe even differences in philosophy about certain things. Sure. Paul was urging them implicitly here to recognize their fundamental underlying unity with those who had a, a different beginning when it came to Christianity. Don't you think? I mean, he's saying, let's, let's remember we're all together in this thing. So let's not forget those who are where it really all started. Yeah. Of course, there is another route behind all of this, and I don't want to make a bigger thing of it than it is, but we do know that when those occasional rich Jews, and I'm speaking of Jewish Jews, not Christians necessarily, visited Jerusalem on oh, the yeah. feast day, the big thing to do was to bring along gifts of all kinds, uh, presents and money to be sure to support 
the temple and its operation, but to support their relatives. I mean, there are a lot of people today who, when they go back to the country from which they mm -hmm. came to the United States, when they go back to whatever that country is, they bring souvenirs and gifts mm -hmm. for the aunties, the uncles, and the cousins, sure. nieces, and nephews. I think this was going on back there. So it was a regular thing. One of the references to the people back in the Jerusalem area uh, in Hebrew was evyonim, the poor ones. That was a regular word used. The, the economy around Jerusalem really was pretty much supported by the temple operations and by sanctified tourism yeah, okay. uh, and pilgrimage. Um, and some unsanctified and tourism. And some of that too, <laughs> for sure. Um, and so, you know, where out uh, and about in the larger Roman world, people could make substantial money Jerusalem didn't have that inherent potential to it. Maybe Galilee with its richer soil did, but not down there. Though the bottom line is that this was a long established practice. And I think that Christians, Jewish Christians, found that they, they still do, they do, were doing the same thing. And it was easy, I think, to, to encourage the Gentiles to come along and join in on this. So, yeah. I do believe there was always that anchoring back in Jerusalem, even for those who, by culture and geography, were quite separate from it. But I think there were also other ties as well. Well, I, I wonder. I've, I think most of us have had the opportunity to visit Jerusalem, and it does yes. have a, you know, it, it, it's hmm. redolent with, uh, you know, evocative mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, influences for those of us who, who share the Christian faith. And I remember our, our Hebrew guide once saying that uh, he used the word mala and mata, above and below. And he said, uh, we all have a home below. That's mata. Mm -hmm. But he says, we all have the same home above. So mm -hmm. where we live, wherever we're from, that's our home below. Sure. It's like saying Jerusalem is mm -hmm. our spiritual home. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. Now, a lot of people who visit Jerusalem for the first time have a sense of kind of homecoming. In other words, it, it's figured in our imaginations. Mm -hmm. We've all heard the stories about it to actually get there. Feel. So maybe Paul is saying... Um, we need to support the folks at home. And whether you've ever been there or not, that's home. Okay. Yeah. Like you're saying, I think, I think people who move from one country to another are often very concerned that the family not lose its connection with the home, the home country. It's still there. Yeah. And I wonder if he's trying to cultivate a sense of belonging to the church that it still has its sentimental headquarters in Jerusalem. Uh, for those who've never been there and might never otherwise have any interest in going there. Bernard, what do you have to say about that? Do you agree? I do. And I also note the uh, care, the fiscal concern that Paul manifests. Mm -hmm. I want you to be in charge of this. I want you to take mm -hmm. the responsibility. Mm -hmm. You're not going to give the money and I disappear and you're unsure where it goes. There is careful handling of the money, and if you deem it advisable, I'm happy to go along, but I don't need, I trust you, appoint the people that you're comfortable with, and it will happen. Mm -hmm. mm. That's, right. that, that's really wise, isn't it? Fiscal yeah. responsibility in the first century, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The people you appoint will take the money to <laughs> Jerusalem. Don't worry about me taking an excursion you know, <laughs> with the money. Um, <laughs> There's probably a lesson there for people who uh, are pastors of wealthy churches, do you think? Something like that? Will you read on for us? Uh, in verse 10? Yes. Be happy to. If Timothy comes, see that he has nothing to fear among you, for he is doing the work of the Lord just as I am. Therefore, let no one despise him. Send him on his way in peace so that he may come to me, for I'm expecting him with the brothers. Now, the brothers is a group. It's like a group of Christians? Yes. Mm -hmm. I, this I've come across that word in the New Testament, the brothers. Yes, yes. This is fascinating for me. Okay. Paul was this magnificent leader. Mm -hmm. Timothy was the perfect assistant. But he was too close to the oak tree to really grow strong. And Paul has to ad ask that a current... Do whatever you like to me, but not to Timothy. Don't treat him badly. He's a gentle soul. He's doing the work of the Lord as I am. Let no one despise him, oh. which doesn't speak strongly of him. No. Timothy is Timothy, 
uh, which is very close in English to timid, mm -hmm. which seems to be the way that it is here. And I see Timothy as the, you know, whenever Paul wanted something, Timothy would have it for him. Yeah. Just the wonderful assistant. Somebody that was not well suited to leadership. And when you go to the book of Timothy. Says, Let no man despise thy youth. Mm -hmm. Exactly. That, that immediately came to my mind. We read this at ordination. We don't stop to think what it means. <laughs> <laughs> the original Greek uh, despise is two different words here in uh, Corinth and in uh, Timothy. Is it? But, but, but all the more <laughs> evidence that there's some kind of a little... Uh, a little issue of uh, um, self-confidence or confidence in the Lord here, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Well, can I read, please, uh, verse 10, as mm -hmm. you did, but I have a different version. Uh -huh. If Timothy comes, see to it that he has nothing to fear while he is with you. So what does that mean? That fulfills what you're Maybe saying. it means he was easily scared. See, for, don't scare Timothy. For, <laughs> they easily scared. <laughs> for he is carrying on the work of the Lord, just as I am. No one then should refuse to accept him. Send him on his way in peace, so that he may return to me. I am expecting him along with the brothers. Now, before you folks brought it up to the fact that... Uh, there's a little something behind Timothy that I didn't know about, but this verse says, now, treat him nicely. Don't upset him, right? Yes. See, I never thought of that before. Yes. Be good to Timothy. Yeah, he's a nice good. fellow, <laughs> and I like him, and well, he's important Well, isn't he to me. young? Isn't he, he young? He is young, and... Uh, How young? I don't know. What he been don't let anybody 20s? look down on you because of something your youth, like but something like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But we know from Second Corinthians that they were a little rough on Paul. And Paul, I think you said it well, is concerned that this not rub off onto Timothy. Mm. At least... Uh, is, is he saying, look, I can take the heat. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> if you're gonna, I can take uh, it, but go <laughs> easy yeah, on same, Timothy. Yeah. Yeah. If you're going to be hard on somebody, let me feel yeah. the blows, but go easy yeah, on Yeah, the spirit Timothy. of Jesus in the garden, you know, let the others go. And uh -huh. yeah. Do you want to read on, please, please? Yes. Us? Now, the next verse is, is really a favorite of mine. <laughs> now concerning, here's another one, now concerning... When I say this is another question that's being answered. Mm -hmm. Now concerning our brother Apollos, I strongly urged him to visit you with the other brothers, but he was not at all willing to come now. He will come when he has the opportunity. <laughs> Irresistible force, immovable object. This is, it sounds to me like Apollos is quite different from Timothy. Yes. He's got to say. <laughs> Polar opposite. <laughs> Timothy's this sort of gentle person who's, you know, he's there and he's helpful and he doesn't attract a lot of attention. It's like Apollos, he may come when he's ready, <laughs> but uh, he's, he's not, not coming come. till he's ready. <laughs> but Paul's not going to push him around. In fact, Paul says there's no way he's coming now. <laughs> That's right. Now not about now. our brother Apollos. He'll I strongly he urged him yeah. to go to you with the brothers. He was quite unwilling to go now. I mean, You'll there go you go. Ready. That's yeah. right. Standing up to Paul. That's right. Paul. <laughs> be on your guard. Stand firm in the faith. Be men of courage. Be strong. Do everything in love. I have a question. Yeah. My suspicion is, and you have the Greek here, that, that often the expression brothers in the original is translated brothers and sisters yeah. because it's to be uh, inclusive of mm. the women as, uh, yes. as well as the men in the community. But here in the two verses we've just looked at, 11 and 12, mm -hmm. the word brothers there appears by itself. Is this yeah. because only the men would have done the traveling kind of thing or Paul is talking about workers uh, with him uh, and they would not have included women or I What's going on there? How, how do you interpret that? This, of course, is an interpretation. There's nothing different in the word here than That's what I mean. Else. Right. The words are the same, and yes. yet they're so translated the, the assumption in different would ways. seem to be, at least uh, on the part of the translator and the committee, that in these instances, Paul would be traveling a, amongst a group of men. Now, of course, we easily make that assumption with Jesus. And every time I read Mark's gospel, we get to Mark 15... And there's a whole band, band of women that, yeah. that travel with Jesus. Mm -hmm. And I thought there were just 13 men who did the laundry, who cooked the food, no. and all the rest of it. And there are all these women we alone that are never that mentioned that. up yeah. to that we point. Know. <laughs> yeah. Okay. 
We do remember from the time when we went through the book of Acts a while back that there were several times when Paul was working his way through Asia Minor and uh, a group takes him this far and another group kind of joins or, or takes over in a relay kind of thing. Paul seems to have, uh, not maybe always, but not unusual to have a little pocket of a few folks with him. Mm -hmm. As for gender issues, all I know is that he says in 2 Corinthians, don't I have a right to have a female traveling companion as so many of the rest of you have? Or you take that for what you wish. Yeah. He was married, wasn't he? For a while. Yeah. If, uh, if I took the lunch that my wife gave me and said I'm off to on a business trip to Damascus and I'll be back a week from Thursday and showed up 14 years later, <laughs> I wouldn't expect to be married there anymore. There would be either. certain strains <laughs> of the relationship. Um, well, and you wonder if that didn't sort of, you know, promote his travel or something. I don't know. We don't know. I mean, we these are speculations no. at any rate. I, but a sensitive uh, reading of the text. I've heard about it. I remember our, uh, someone we've referred to many times, HMS Richards, mm -hmm. talking about, I think, someone who was a relative of his back, John, uh, you know, John Wesley, mm -hmm. who, according to some accounts, had a very poor marriage. Mm -hmm. And maybe that accounts for his motivation to get out and preach so much in distant places because home was not a place that held a lot of attractions. But I think this is just high speculation. We don't know. No, we don't. But Paul's clear, plans for travel. Paul plans, I send me on my way wherever I go. He there feels go. the call of the gospel. I'm going to ask you to read on. Well, all right. Maybe we'll find out who some of these brethren yes, are. That's Verse 15 right. we picks got five up. Five minutes. <laughs> Verse 15 picks up and names a number of such. So, uh, brothers and sisters, we, mm -hmm. we read in the new, new Revised Standard, but it's brothers in the original. You know that members of the household of Stephanas were the first converts in Achaia, and they've devoted themselves to the service of the saints. These are all people who are servant leaders now, so to speak. Huh? And I urge you to put yourselves at the service of such people. You serve them now. They've been serving. You, you serve them. Take care of them. And everyone who works and toils along with them. Verse 17, I rejoice at the coming of Stephanas and Fortunatus and Achaius, um, Achaicus, because they have made up for your absence. They refreshed my spirit as well as yours. So give recognition to sight. Apparently people, perhaps from, from Corinth, if I understand correctly, I'm not sure of that, Paul has been encouraged by these people. They've come to him. Mm -hmm. Paul says, I wish I could have had all of us together, but we've had these representatives and it's been a real help. We could go on, but you get the idea. Go here. ahead and just finish uh, well, the, the chapter. Well, the churches of Asia, that we would call Turkey today, send greetings. Aquila and Prisca, they were in Rome at one point, we know, but here they're there. Um, together with the church in their house, greet you warmly in the Lord. And all of the brothers and sisters send greetings. Greet one another with a holy kiss. Mm -hmm. And then Paul, at that point apparently, stalks over, seizes the quill from the hand of his secretary, who's been taking dictation all the way through here, and, and writes, look, I, Paul, I'm addressing you, greeting you with my own hand. Let anyone be accursed who has no love for the Lord. Our Lord come. It's a closing benediction at the end of a worship service. Paul knows this will be read in church, so it's a benediction. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with you. My love be with all of you in Christ Jesus. Um, I want to ask, uh, there is uh, some <coughs> thought to the fact that maybe he couldn't see well. And mm. when he wrote, he used big, big letters. characters, mm -hmm. big letters. Yep. And I wondered if any of you had heard that before. Yeah. Uh, elsewhere, he writes, look what big letters I'm I, writing. Uh, with. That's right. Uh, he's he trying as best he can before Skype has been invented to connect as directly as he can with these people. Mm. That's what this is about. Listen, people, it's me, Paul. You know, <laughs> hello. <clears throat> yeah. Um, yeah, the grace of Jesus. This is kind of the benediction at the end of a service that he, he puts in here. Yeah, he says, my love to all of you in Christ Jesus, yeah. amen. Yeah. I, I think Paul, well, when we meet Paul in heaven, um, are you going to ask him, were you that firm all the time? Did you have a soft spot in your heart for some of those people? Because it seems like he <laughs> goes back and forth. Yeah, he, he's passionate for these people. He calls them his children. Yes, you know. that's right. 
Um, do you have anything to add here? Uh, we have a little over a minute. Uh, just one thing, uh, verse 14. Okay. We, you know, we paused last time to notice the mention of the law. Uh, keep alert, stand firm, verse 13, in your faith. Be courageous, be strong. Let all that you do be done in love. Right? Yes, do And everything. in 1 Corinthians 13, Paul said in effect, the church can survive without spiritual gifts. It won't, it won't function as well, but the church cannot survive without love. That is the one thing that is non-negotiable. That must come first and permeate everything. And in the midst of these, he strikes that note. Let all that you do be done in love. Beautiful. Now, Corinth really needed to hear that. And he, but he puts it in there, and we need to hear that today. We do. We make enemies. We argue. We fight. Love. Love, says Paul. And Paul knew what it was to be unloving. And he knew the love of Christ and the change it made in his life. Very well said. Um, we have just a few seconds left, and we've finished 1 Corinthians, and we are going to the next chapter, which is 2 Corinthians, and we hope you will join us as we carry on with Paul and see what he has to say in this, uh, in this second book. I hope all of you have enjoyed 1 Corinthians, as have I, mm. and we hope that you'll join us next time. This is Carolyn Thompson for Searching for Answers.